worship this morning. This weekend, we are celebrating Christ the King. It is the official last weekend of the church year, the last Sunday of the church year. We think back to all the things that we have seen from the very beginning of this church year as we started in the season of Advent, and then Christmas, and our Savior's birth in Bethlehem, and then His suffering and death, and His glorious resurrection, the gifts that come through the Holy Spirit in the season of Pentecost. Today we look at all those blessings and we give thanks to God, our Savior. He is our King. We celebrate our King today by worshiping and praising His name, coming before Him with our praises and our prayers listening to his word and taking it to heart, and receiving his body and blood in the sacrament. As we worship, we're going to follow the service that is laid out for us. Let us turn to that first hymn, it's Glory Be to God the Father, number 239. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory be to God.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by your victory, you have broken the power of the evil one. Fill our hearts with joy and peace as we look with hope to that day when every creature in heaven and earth will acclaim you, King of kings and Lord of lords, to your unending praise and glory. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first lesson that we hear and take to heart today is recorded for us in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15. It's part of the great resurrection chapter. Yes, Jesus, by his resurrection, has defeated death. And as our king, we share in his victory over death. Let's listen. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came by a man, the resurrection of the dead also is going to come by a man. For as in Adam they all die, so also in Christ they all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ as the firstfruits, and then Christ's people at his coming. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has done away with every other ruler and every other authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Death is the last enemy to be done away with. Certainly, he has put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, when it says that all things have been put in subjection, obviously that does not include the one who subjected all things to him. But when all things have been subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, in order that God may be all in all. The word of our Lord. Alleluia. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Alleluia. Alleluia. Please stand for the gospel. In the gospel lesson, we see Jesus, our King, as he is brought to the point where he truly serves his people in the utmost, suffering and dying for them. Even though he is mocked, yet he is our King. Matthew 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, knelt in front of him, and mocked him by saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spit on him, took the staff, and hit him repeatedly on his head. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. The Gospel of our Lord. I invite you to confess the one Christian faith by saying together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, 
who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Let's sing our next hymn, Saints Behold the Sight is Glorious, number 216. God's grace and mercy and peace are truly yours through Christ, our eternal King. Amen. Our sermon text is recorded for us in the book of Ezekiel, the prophet, chapter 34. Here the Lord tells His people through the prophet that He is the one who is going to rule over them. He is the one who is going to provide for them. He is their shepherd. He is their king. And we rejoice that He does the same for us, His people, today. Let's turn to these words, and you can follow along on the screens or in the printed bulletin. Ezekiel 34. For this is what the Lord God says, I myself will seek the welfare of my flock and examine them carefully. As a shepherd examines his flock when he is with his sheep that have been scattered, so I will examine my flock and rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. I will shepherd them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys, and in the settlements of the land. I will pasture them in good pasture, and their grazing land will be on the high mountains of Israel." There they will lie down in good grazing land, and they will pasture on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will shepherd my flock, and I myself will let them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, I will bring back the strays, I will bind up the injured, I will strengthen the weak. I will destroy the fat and the strong, and I will shepherd them in justice." Therefore, this is what the Lord God says to them, I myself am going to judge between the fat sheep and the skinny sheep, because you have shoved them with your side and shoulder and knocked down all the weak with your horns until you had scattered them abroad. I will save my flock so that they will not become plunder anymore. 
I will judge between one sheep and another. Then I will raise up over them one shepherd, and he will tend them, my servant David. He will tend them, and he will be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. This is God's word. Let's pray. O Lord, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Dear people of God's kingdom, who knew God doesn't like fat sheep, right? That's what he says in our text pretty much, right? He says, I will destroy the fat and the strong. I am going to judge between the fat sheep and the skinny sheep. I guess God doesn't like fat sheep. Well, I think you are already thinking along the same lines that I am. He's not really talking about sheep when he talks about his flock and about shepherd. He's talking about people, isn't he? I think it's pretty obvious from the text. He's talking about people like you and me, people long ago at the time of Ezekiel. Well, now we're starting maybe to think about our waistlines and maybe our body mass index. Maybe if God doesn't like fat sheep, we have to watch our weight, right, if he's going to love us. Well, before we start worrying about that, that that's not what he means either. What, what is the thing that makes fat sheep fat sheep? What, how does he describe them? What is the problem with them? He says, because you have shoved them with your side and shoulder and knocked down all the weak with your horns until you have scattered them abroad. Sheep. Those creatures covered in wool, horns on their heads, not the smartest. If you get a big sheep that can dominate the rest, I think we can understand what's going to happen. Wherever you find the, the best grass to graze on, when the little ones and the young ones and the weak ones and the sick come and they're looking for that best grass and they find it and they start eating, the big one's going to come along and just kind of shove them aside and take his more than fair share of the green grass. Or along the river where the water pools calmly and it's easy to drink, especially for the little or the weak. And there they gather to get their sips of precious water. You know what's going to happen. Here comes the big one shoving his way in because he wants to drink from those calm waters. Probably even knocking some of those little ones over or maybe even into the river. Oh, and of course, where the, the grass is the fluffiest, where it's the most comfortable to lay on, he's going to find that spot and he's going to settle right in. And if anybody wants to come over and share it with him, that's not going to happen. That's the problem with fat sheep. Fat sheep that think that they can push other people around, that they should get their way. And they should always get the best, even at the expense of everyone else, and especially the young and the weak and the poor. God says, I will judge between the fat sheep and the skinny sheep. I will judge between them. I'm sure that you know people more than you know sheep that are like that. They get their way. Whether it is because they have the authority, the power, the influence, or they have the money, or maybe it's the personality, they get their way. When it seems like somebody's going to be able to take advantage of them, they're the ones who come along and push their way in and to seize what they want to take. There doesn't seem to be much remorse or consideration for others. It could be a group. It could be a political party. It could be an organization striving for power, and when they get it, they use it for their own advantage. Or maybe it's the person in your school or work or family. They walk into the room, they walk into the house, they sit down at the dinner table, and somehow their plate always seems to be the fullest. In the argument, they're the one that always gets the loudest. And if somebody has some kind of disadvantage, they make sure to exploit it. 
they abuse. I think we all know people like that, organizations like that. But the real danger for us, dear Christians, dear people of God, it's not so much the fault of others, but it's the fact that even as we think of others who may be at fault, you know tables turn, right? You know that tides reverse, and soon those who were not in power then do have power. And what happens then? Will those who have suddenly newfound power use it the way they should, or are instead they going to do the exact same thing that they were accusing others of before? The very same things that they suffered, they're now going to impose on others. Maybe you found yourself in that situation. At one time, you were on the short end of the stick, so to speak, and then when tide turned and you got the long end of the stick and you had the advantage, you decided to use it. Oh, it was only fair. After all, you were abused before, right? Doesn't matter. God doesn't like fat sheep. Shoving, pushing, taking advantage. It is for that reason that God doesn't leave judgment in the hands of sinners, doesn't leave it in the hands of the ones who have every advantage or those who don't. What does he say? He says, I myself, I will shepherd them. I myself will shepherd my flock. I myself will make them lie down. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. I will save my flock so that it will not become plunder anymore. I will judge between one sheep and another. God himself is the shepherd and king. He is the one who is going to be able to take the rich pasture, the quiet waters, the comfortable places of rest, and make sure that you get what you need and that everybody gets what they need. He is the one who is able to do it. You know our Savior, Jesus Christ. You saw him again today in the gospel lesson. The one who holds all power in his hand. The one who can call on legions and legions of angels to accomplish whatever he would desire. What does he do? Does he seize that power and begin to wield it for his own advantage? Does he do? Of course not. Instead, when he is surrounded by his enemies, when they abuse him and mock him, he lets them. Why? Not because he's powerless or weak, not because he's timid, not because he's given up, but because he has not come to be served but to serve and give his life as the ransom for many. As he was being beaten by those soldiers, he knew that this was all exactly as God had planned. He had prayed the night before, Lord, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not my will but yours be done. And so the Lord's will, the will of his heavenly Father was done. After abusing him, they led him away to crucify him. Talk about suffering. Talk about abuse. And you know why? It's because of us, because of the world of sinners and we who inhabit it. That Jesus himself was punished. Talk about getting the short end of the stick, right? Being on the low side of the tide. Talk about being judged. It was Jesus who suffered the full wrath of the justice of the Heavenly Father. Why did Jesus endure it? 
so that you, fat or skinny, sinful sheep, would not be judged by the God and condemned. But instead, so that when God looks at you, instead of seeing the sinner that you are, he sees a perfection, a perfection achieved only by Jesus Christ and now given to you. You see, Jesus on that cross wasn't defeated. He was winning a victory, defeating the worst of our enemies. Just as much as we might like to think of those around us in this life as enemies, surely the ones that need to be defeated and destroyed their power removed our sin, death, and the devil. And so that's exactly what Jesus came to do. And by God's power and grace, that is exactly what he accomplished. And that is exactly what he now gives to you. Our king shares his victory with us. He tells you that you are his people, and that he will watch over you. That shepherd, Jesus our Savior, rules. He rules in your hearts. He rules over the world. He pastures you with the richness of his word. He lets you come here to drink deep of the waters of life. He bids you rest. As we see once again all that our Savior has done, and find in Him all that we need, our peace, our joy, our rest. We gladly listen and follow Him. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am humble and gentle in heart. You will find rest for your souls. We, like our Savior Jesus, take upon that yoke of humble service in His kingdom, not looking for our own advantage, not looking of how we can get ahead, but how we can use all that we are and all that we have to serve others, to make sure that others have exactly what they need in this world, whether it be a meal on Thanksgiving Day or whether it be a roof over their heads, clothes on their backs, or most importantly, the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Savior, that they know Jesus, their King, and the victory he has won. And whether they be fat or skinny or whatever they may be, sinners one and all, that they know the victory of Jesus. It's true, actually, that God doesn't hate fat sheep. He loves us all, each and every one. That's why Jesus suffered so much. That's why Jesus calls us, one and all, to be humble, repentant, trusting, and following. Jesus is the shepherd, the Savior, the King. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God, which surpasses our understanding, guard and keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. As we bring our prayers to God through Jesus our King, we include two members of our congregation in our prayers. We pray for Ray Wolf, who has cancer, and we, he is going to undergo a procedure this week to hopefully remove that cancer. So we pray for him as he prepares for surgery. We also pray for our sister in Christ, Bertha Laven. She just was put on hospice and is apparently coming to the end of her time among us. We pray. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. 
You are worthy, O Christ, our King, to receive honor and glory and praise, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You are worthy, Christ, our King, to receive honor and glory and praise because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased us for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation you have called us into your kingdom and have made us priests to serve you, our God and Father. We give thanks to you, O Christ, our Shepherd King, because you searched for us and you have found us. Continue to lead us to the green pastures and quiet waters of your saving love, that we may enjoy peace and comfort for our souls. When our hearts are broken with sin and guilt, bind them up, heal us, strengthen us when we face temptation and are feeling weak. We give thanks, Almighty God, because you have taken your great power and begun to reign. With your mighty power, break and defeat every evil plan and purpose of the devil the ungodly influences and ideas of the world and of our own sinful nature. Use your power to calm unrest among nations and peoples so that your kingdom may truly spread and grow. O Christ, our King, you rule over all. You will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. You have destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Continue to rule in our hearts that we may serve you faithfully and speak all the more boldly of your saving love. O Lord God, just as you have promised your abiding presence to your people everywhere and in every circumstance, we ask that you fulfill that promise to our brother in Christ, Ray Wolf, as he prepares for surgery. Remove all anxiety and fear from his heart. Lead him to put his full confidence in you. Bless the surgeon and those who attend. Give success to that surgery as it pleases you. Be with Ray as he recovers and fill him with a true thankfulness for all of your blessings. Eternal Father, you alone make decisions about life and death. We ask that you would look in mercy on Bertha Laban, whose departure from this life seems close at hand. As she passes through the valley of the shadow of death, comfort her with the assurance that you are with her, that she need not have any fear. Spare her any physical pain. Encourage her loved ones with the sure hope of glory that is prepared for all those whom you have called into your kingdom, your dear sheep. Into your hands we commit her, for you are our Lord, our God, our King. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever, King of kings and Lord of lords. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. O Lord, we also join to pray as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we now turn to the celebration of the sacrament, the congregation may be seated. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who preserves his church to the end of time, when he will come again as King to judge all people and take his own to glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Now prepare to receive the Lord's Supper. We ask those of you of our, of our membership and fellowship who are preparing to take the Lord's Supper to please stand. And as we come around with the elements, please cup your hands to receive the wafer.
May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in the true faith unto eternal life. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn for our worship today. Crown him with many crowns, number 341. Again, welcome. Glad you could join us for our worship today, whether it was in person or online or on our radio broadcast. We do want to thank the donation for our radio broadcast this weekend in memory of Dan Frader. Thank you very much. Also wanted to highlight that we are having our Thanksgiving worship this coming week on Wednesday evening at 6.30 and that Thursday morning at 9 o'clock a.m. We are also planning a Thanksgiving meal from 10.30 to 12.30 here at St. Paul's. We are doing delivery and curbside pickup as well. Uh, the, there is a sign-up sheet for those who wish to help, especially we need help with delivery. You know, people that know the area well and are able to make deliveries because there are obviously going to be a lot of them. So if you're interested, uh, please uh, talk to me or sign up on the sheet. Also uh, just wanted to highlight the fact that uh, this coming month of December, we are going to continue having our mask-only services. In fact, uh, we're going to do more of them. We're going to be doing them every Thursday, especially that 3rd and the 10th and then the 17th. Uh, those two, third, the 3rd and the 17th are going to be communion. Also then the following Thursdays are going to be Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, so watch for more information on a mask-only service for those as well. Those are the main announcements. I encourage you to stick around for our fellowship time right afterwards. Also, there's going to be Sunday school, so please uh, stick around for a little bit and uh, chat, and we'll be able to encourage one another as we continue to serve one another in God's kingdom, looking out for one another, strengthening the weak, and encouraging so that we all may continue to live with Christ in His kingdom. May God grant you have peace always. Amen.